the muting because of the background. Mm -hmm. Great, we go. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, to our show uh, tonight. Um, let, let us uh, begin with the word of prayer. Um, everlasting Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for taking care of us throughout the day and for the activities that we are able to do. As we are about to begin this session, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. Um, that your strength uh, will be upon us. You also give us the understanding that we need for this show, oh Lord. And whatever things that we are taught uh, tonight, oh Lord, we we'll put them into action. We thank you and we exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. It is that we are able to Amen. Amen. So, uh, let's all welcome Mr. Roy for this session. And um, I hope you have your notebooks and your pens ready. Karibu sana, Mr. Roy. Take over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And a big welcome to uh, all our viewers on YouTube Live. This is the third episode of The Family Show, uh, a show that started uh, two weeks ago, a show that is focusing on issues that are affecting the family. And uh, our aim at The Family Show is to inspire families, to equip families with the end of transforming families. We have very many conversations lined up for us, but tonight the conversation, as you might have seen, is effective communication in the family. With us tonight is my brother, my good friend, a brother who has so many cups to wear, but tonight I choose to introduce him just as a leadership and strategy consultant. He is a published author of multiple titles, and he's going to lead us tonight in this conversation, effective communication in the family. And our guest tonight is none other than Joel Kobia, AKA, also known as, proudly known as Tijo himself. My brother Tijo, welcome. Um, Perhaps before we start, I need to start from reading to us another SMS that I received. Maybe we need to start from there. And uh, I want to pose it as a question to you, Tijo. Uh, perhaps the first question you'll answer then before you uh, get us into what you have prepared for us tonight. And the question that I have here is um, from a lady who wrote and said that she is the chitty chatty kind of person. She likes talking and talking. Now, she is in this family with a partner who long time ago used to also be very uh, encouraging in terms of listening to the conversations and contributing and also talking, and therefore they used to communicate. So, but then she says at some point things changed and um, she finds herself talking to herself a lot of times. And, and, and our brother here uh, doesn't really seem to be so much interested in communication, in fact, she says in the SMS that at some point, the guy said that it is not a must that we keep talking every day. On one occasion when she summoned him or rather called him for them to have a, call, a conversation. Let me ask you, Tijo, is communication that serious in a family setting? Because again, the SMS went further, I think to the tail end, it was mentioned that even the children complain that their father is no longer communicating to them the way he used to. I don't know. Give us your take. Wow, that, that's a wonderful question. And thank you so much, Coach Roy, for having me here. It's a, such a pleasure. Communication is the, the backbone of any society. Communication is the thing that holds a family together. It's a thing that holds a society together. And when there's no effective communication, then you find things shall not move as they ought to move. When it comes to the corporate world, you want to make sure that there's 
good communication from the CEO to the very least considered person in the organization. Similarly, family setup, you need there to be a free flow of information. There is one of the books that is recommended for couples. The book is entitled, His Needs, Her Needs. And we advocate that every person who is in a family, they should look for that book, His Needs, Her Needs. And you find that the needs of a man are very different from the needs of a lady. What you could be considering as top priority as a lady probably is not top priority as a man. Ladies are looking for affection. Men probably are looking for something else, which is not affection, yes? When it comes to communication, in terms of talking, ladies speak from their heart and they really want to connect with you from their heart. Men want to communicate from their minds. It's all about logic, yeah? So if it's not making sense, they would don't want to bring the emotions to it. It's all about logic, yeah? So well, it's well, for well, us well, to well. understand how we are wired and make sure that we are able to treat others the way they are wired and not the way we would like them to treat us. Aha, uh -huh. on that wiring note, take a pause. Our viewers, I want to encourage us to ask our questions, to contribute to this conversation in the comment section. We will pick all the questions in the question and answer section. We will be able to address each of them. Uh, TJ, I want to give, us, to give you time to just flow with the, that thought of wiring. Uh, you already make me feel like I'm, I'm wired. I don't know whether I'll be electrocuted, but let me just imagine that the wiring that I have been wired uh, does not carry current that can be dangerous to me. Please take it away, Tito. Thank you so much, Coach Roy. As you've heard, my name is Joel Kobia or Tijo, and I am a family person. I'm married for, this is my 13th year. I'm just a teenager when it comes to marriage. And I'm blessed with children by God's grace and mercy. I'm also a committed Christian. So some of the principles that I might be sharing today will be anchored on the living word of God. They tell us that everything that we do communicates something. Everything we do communicates something. Your dress code communicates something. Your sitting style communicates something. The hands posture communicates something. Everything that you do communicates something. Your fresh expressions communicate something. And the most unfortunate thing is that most assume that communication is all about words. It's all about you coming up with the kind of words that you'd like to share with the other person and just opening your mouth and sharing those kind of words. And we least forget that everything we do communicates something. So what is this thing called communication? Communication is the free flow of information from the sender or from the source to the intended person that is the recipient. And when we are talking about communication, number one, we need to identify the sender. The sender is the person with the information. So as the person who wants to communicate in that family setup, question number one is, what do you want to communicate? Do you have, what is it that you want to communicate? The moment you've clarified the what of communication, then the next thing would be for you to agree with yourself how you're going to encode that word, that message. How do you encode? Encoding basically is packaging. First of all, you clarify what you want to say. Then number two, you want to come up with a way of packaging or encoding. Now, the moment you are encoding your message, the moment you're packaging your message, you should have in mind the person who is going to decode it. You're supposed to have in mind the person who is supposed to decode it. Decoding means that that person is able to unpackage it. That person is able to get the intended meaning. So item number one, we are talking about the source, that is the sender. Number two, we are talking about the message. Number three, we are talking about encoding, packaging. And as we are packaging, we're asking ourselves, will this person be able to get the password? or the passcode that is required for them to understand exactly what I wanted to communicate to them. Then the other component of communication is the channel. What channel are you going to use in this communication? Are you going to send an SMS? 
Are you going to scream? Are you going to shout using your voice? Are you going to send an email? Are you going to just dramatize it? Allow them to read from your actions. What is the best way of you making sure that the message gets to the other individual? Then, of course, we've talked about encoding it and the other person is supposed to decode it in order for them to understand or to interpret the meaning that was set behind that communication. And when you look at communication in a family setup, there is nothing like effective communication if all these other components of communication have not been taken into consideration. For example, the moment you want to communicate to your spouse about your salary increment, or the moment you want to compare your parenting skills, or you want to check out how your children are doing, it's going to be very hard for you to do that probably through an email if that person is available. It might be a bit hard for you to do it on phone call. For that reason, you might decide to do it physically. So in communication, we are looking at several aspects. Number one, verbal. Verbal, you want to use your words. You want to communicate by use of your words. Then the other one could be through your actions. And actions here, it's nonverbal. And here we could be looking at several things. We could be looking at the body language. We could be looking at the facial expressions. We could be looking at your posture, how you stood, or probably your eye contact, how you're looking at that other individual. And we're asking ourselves, are all these things communicating exactly what you want to say? It's very hard for you to say that I'm happy when you're looking down. My audience, those who are listening to me, kindly look down and try to say, I'm very happy today. I mean, it's very hard for you to really express it, that you're very happy today when you're looking down. It's also very hard for you to say, I'm very sad when you're looking up. Just try it out, just try it out. I'm very sad. I mean, it's, it's very hard for you to say, I'm very sad when you're looking up, yeah? So your actions and your words should be incongruent, they should be in tandem, they should be flowing in the same direction. When you're talking to an individual, asking them to come, there's no way you're going to tell that person, come, and you're doing like this, come. The moment you want them to come, it's going to be like, come, you're drawing them closer to you. So there's no way you're going to look at your son and tell them, I love you very much and you're staring, your facial expressions are not communicating exactly the way you want it taken, the way you want it decoded. So by the time it comes to us to think about how do we go about communication, we really need to understand which is the most effective way of doing it. Is it supposed to be done verbally? Is it supposed to be done verbally? But the most unfortunate thing is that they tell us that actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. So what you do to me is louder than what you tell me. Some people always say, I would rather you beat me than, no, I would rather you, you beat me hard than to shout and scream at me. I mean, there are those people who, when it comes to words that have come from out of your mouth, I mean, they're very, very powerful. And for them, they have considered words stronger than actions. There are others who say, I don't care what you do to me as long as you keep telling me what I want to hear. So as long as you keep telling them the sweet nothings and you cause them to feel good, excited, and all those other kind of things, some people don't care what you say. All they care is exactly what you do to them. But in order for us to strike that balance, there's no way that we can replace one with another. Ladies are more of the spoken word as compared to men. For a man, being told I love you, to some extent, it might be neither here nor there. <laughs> but for the ladies, the words I love you, they mean so much. The easiest way they tell us to a lady's heart is through the words is through the actions, 
but the easiest way to a man's heart, they tell us, is through the stomach action. So ladies, on most occasions, could be vocal oriented and men could be action oriented. But in order for us to strike a good equilibrium, then we need to make sure that we need to use the two at the same time. Now, in his book, in the book, his needs, her needs, you find that it becomes very hard for a lady to judge my, the gentleman on the same standards. And you find what is a priority to a lady might not become a priority to man. And it's good for you to really understand how your partner or how your family members are wired. Remember this, we are the way we are because of three things. Number one, because of your nature. Nature, this is how you're wired. There are some people who are extroverts, others are introverts, others are subverts. They are neither extroverts or introverts. Some people could be classified as sanguines. These people love talking a lot. These people love expressing themselves a lot. These people don't, are not able to keep secrets. I mean, when they get some new news, some news that should be shared with their partner, their mouth is shaking and they feel like, ah, I have to share that information as soon as possible. Now, these people are extroverted. So they are most joyful, they are most at peace when they are expressive. When they are sad, they're not going to keep it to themselves. They are going to express themselves. They're going to tell you how they feel. When they are very, very sad, when they are very, very happy, it's very hard for you not to know because they are very expressive. You're going to look at their facial expressions and you're able to tell that this person is angry or hungry or this person is sad or this person is very, very, very happy. Now, sanguines make our world a very good place. They are the people who keep entertaining us. And the good thing about these individuals is that they don't keep grudges. They don't keep grudges, not because they don't want, it's because they've got a very short memory span on most occasions. That is what we are told. These are the people that you're going to have a quarrel with today, but the, the following day, tomorrow morning, they're smiling at you. And you wonder, I thought I did something very bad to this person. I thought they're not supposed to be communicating or speaking to me. How come they're still speaking to me? They're called sanguines. Their forgiveness comes very, very fast within a snap. These are the people that you're going to be with for five minutes or 10 minutes or even one minute. And you feel as if you know them forever. Communicating with these individuals is very, very easy. Why? Because they are rapport builders. These are the people that don't just keep to themselves. These are the people that will never allow anything to trouble them without them verbalizing, without them talking about it. We are talking about extroverts, the sanguines. Now, when you're dealing with extroverts, the sanguines, it's very good for you to know that these people are expressive. These people love communication. These people love the touch. These people love the action. These people want to be appreciated. They are very much connected to the word of mouth. What are you going to tell to, to, tell to them? When they've done something good, they want to be appreciated in public. These are the sanguines. So in order for you to have an effective communication with these individuals, just understand that's how they are wired. Category number two of extroverts, we are looking at the cholerics. Now cholerics on most occasions, yes, they like interacting with people, they like associating with people, but not to the extent of sanguines. The sanguines, when they come to the party, that's the time that the party is starting. But the cholerics, are a bit temperamental. These people are a bit guided. These people are a bit governed. They interact with you for a good reason. They are going to speak for a good reason. And on most occasions, these people are good leaders. These people are authoritative. These people are good decision makers. They want, they've got a very strong ego. They want to be appreciated with every single small thing that they do. These are the people that are not going to give in that fundraiser if no one is going to notice them. These are the people that are not going to just sit down in class just for the sake of sitting. They just want to prove to everyone else 
that they are sharper than them, they are cleverer than them, they are stronger than them. These are the colleagues that will always keep asking you, did you get that promotion? These are the individuals that are always asking you, how many marks did you get? They're always comparing themselves with another. So if you don't understand that the nature of this person is that they are extroverted and they're cholerics, you'll always mistake them. These people are always forceful. They always want to have the final word. It's either their way or the highway. I mean, they're always going to push their way in order for things to happen exactly the way they are supposed to be. Now, when you're dealing with that kind of a person in the family setup, and you know that this person is a choleric, it becomes very hard for you to convince them on anything. How about you understanding that you can place those words, you can place those suggestions in their mouth. You can place everything that you want as a suggestion and you ask them, what do you feel or what do you think? If it's that gentleman that is only the one who can say to Nanda Inje, we are going out and we go, don't keep arguing with them. Just sit down with him in the bedroom or somewhere else in the car and give suggestions. Well, well I, sweetheart, I don't think it's good for us to go out today because tomorrow you have a very critical meeting and children are doing the exam tomorrow morning. And I know you being a great husband or a good sweetheart, you'd not like to see something bad happening to our children. How about us probably doing this tomorrow afternoon? How about us probably doing this on Saturday? I know Saturday you're free and your schedule is open. What do you think about that? Now, this individual is going to say, ah, yes, yes, yes. Give me some time to think about it. They're not going to think about it. They're just going to say yes, but uh, just for the sake of them, uh, looking as if they have control, they're going to say, yes, let me think about it. Then later on, they're going to tell you, sweetheart, I thought about it and I think, uh, let's have it on Saturday. Then they're going to come to the children and tell them, we are not going to go out tomorrow. We are going to go on Saturday. But who made the decision? <laughs> <laughs> it's not them, it's that other individual. The spouse could be the husband or the wife is the one who made that decision. So the moment you understand how someone is wired, you're not going to have fights with them. You're going to have very effective communication with such kind of a personality. They always tell us that if two cholerics get married, the husband is a choleric, the wife is a choleric, they always advise us that they should have a house close to the police station. These are the people you will hear in the house saying, and the husband is and there's no one who is willing to close the eye being the first. No one is willing to budge. Everyone thinks that, I mean, I have the rights. I'm a human being. I also have my rights. So under such circumstances, it's good for one to tone down. It's good for us to really understand that when one is up, the other one should be slightly low. When we look at the sanguine again, let's go back to the sanguine, you find these people are a bit disorganized. We said that communication is both verbal and physical, yeah, non-verbal. And you find these people, probably they're going to throw stockings. They are stockings where they're not supposed to be. Uh, probably they're going to press the toothpaste from the neck instead of from the legs. And this other individual is like, can't you do these things? They're very simple. For how long will I keep telling you? Now, the sanguine, if they don't understand that there's someone else called a melancholy, then they're going to have issues. Melancholies are introverted. Melancholies are perfectionist. Melancholies believe that everything ought to be done exactly the way it's supposed to be done. So if you don't press that toothpaste the way it's supposed to be pressed, if you don't make your bed the way it's supposed to be made, if you don't, the person wiping their desk at the office, if they don't replace everything exactly where it was, then that's going to be an issue. When you're dealing with melancholies, may they be your children, may they be the husband or the spouse, it's good for you to very much be aware of who a melancholy is. Now, melancholies are perfectionists. Melancholies are complicated. They can make something huge, a mountain out of an anthill. These are the individuals that will always look at the glass, glass sometimes half empty, instead of looking at it, are full. These individuals 
tend to suffer from analysis paralysis. Something very small, they want to go do some shopping, but they want to compare shop number one, shop number two, shop number three. And these are the person, sanguine is a very fast decision maker, choleric is a very fast decision maker, they are wondering. Now, must you waste 20 hours or five hours looking for something that you're going just to say five shillings? Sometimes, if you don't understand, they are melancholies, and that's how exactly they are wired then you're going to have issues with them. These people are very sharp. They are very clever. These are the children will always get number one, number one, number one. Even before you finish asking them the question, they already have the answer. I mean, these people are very sharp. And on that account, their minds, their brain is super, super. And because their mind is very good, when in a Natakama Gundi, it becomes very hard for them to forget. If they don't forget, that means they're going to keep grudges. You're going to do something bad to that kid when they are 10 years old, when they are five years old, by the time they are 30, they are reminding you, mom, I remind, I remember what you did to me when I was this and that age. So when it comes to communicating with this person who is melancholy, you should be very, very careful. They are perfectionists. They've got very good memories. Sometimes they're very judgmental and they can suffer from analysis paralysis, but, we love and appreciate them because they've got a very refined attitude towards details. So when you want something done to perfection, these are the individuals that you want to look for. Sanguines are not very perfect when it comes to the kind of things that they're supposed to be doing, but you find melancholies are super perfect. We are talking about how you are wired. Now, the last category could be these individuals who seem to be lazy all the time. When they are eating, they are holding their face. When they are walking, I mean, they are pulling their legs and you're wondering. Mm. These are the individuals, sometimes you find them to be a bit sluggish. They like keeping to themselves. And when it comes to sharing their things, sometimes they are a bit selfish. They are not stingy, but they are a bit selfish. These are the kids, when they were visited in high school or in primary school, the boarding school where they are, they used to eat their chapatis or the goodies brought by their parents covering themselves under their blanket because they don't want anyone to borrow them. And if anyone asks them for them, they, they, they want to tell them, I, I mean, you can go look for yours. Um, uh, was it because of me that you're not visited? <laughs> Every man should carry his own body. And, and for that reason, you find these people are a bit judgmental. They are not swift when it comes to expressing themselves. They are not swift when it comes to communication. And the contrary is true because they don't speak externally, they speak internally. They have a lot of voices playing around in their minds. These are the individuals that will give you a knockout in their mind. These are the individ individuals that are going to destroy you in their minds. They're going to throw all manner of curses and insults in your mind, in their minds, but they're not going to let you know. On the external, you're just going to look at a person with a screensaver. And if you are told that that person murdered, you are like, no, that person can't. If you are told that that kid did some bad things in school, you are like, no, my kid cannot afford to do such kind of bad things in school. My kid is a good kid, yeah? You're always defensive on this kind of an individual. It becomes very hard for this person to make it if you don't understand that that's how they are wired. We said we are the way we are when it comes to communication before, because of four things. Number one, because of your nature. That's how you're wired. Extrovert, introvert. You can't change yourself from being an extrovert into an introvert. We also talked about the four categories, subcategories. Yeah, it's recommended by Tim Lahin. I've also done all this analysis in my second book, Go for Gold, The Art of Asking Right. We've talked about the sanguines. We've talked about the cholerics. We've talked about the melancholies and the phlegmatics. It's good for you to understand how you are wired. Number two, we are the way we are because of our choices. Sometimes the choices or the circumstances that the world presents to us demand us, demand that we change the way we think, that we change the way we act. For example, if you had a bad day at work and you're getting to your house, chances are very high that you're going to be a person that no one wants to come close to. Why? Because your day was bad. But you have a choice. You can decide to extend your day 
home, or you can tell yourself, I left all my troubles. I left all my persecutions, all my bad things that happened at work. I left them at work. I'm not bring them home. Here we are talking about you making the choices. So that effective communication is going to be not necessarily because of the way you're wired, but because of the choices that you keep making every single day. God says, choose this day. <laughs> who you will serve. There's a choice between right and wrong. It's up to you to make up your mind. What will I go for? Now, the most unfortunate or fortunate thing is that we are the top cheerleader in our lives. We are the top peer pressures in our lives. There's nothing that you're going to do on the face of the earth without giving yourself the permission to do it. That person who is saying, Akianani, there's no way a lady can look badly at me or retort at me. I can beat her up. I can beat her up. That means they have permitted themselves to beat someone up when they don't do right. You hear a parent saying, wait, wait. if I send you to the shop and you don't bring me the change, I can even slash your fingers. That means they've permitted themselves to slash the kid's fingers if they, go, they are sent to the shop and they don't do exactly the way they were supposed to have done. In order for you to become an effective communicator, make sure that you're giving yourself the right memory, the, the right multiple choices. <laughs> the right multiple choices. In my first book, Between Me and My Exploits, Overcoming Self-Imposed Limitations to Greatness, I remind you that we are too close to ourselves, yet you are too far away. And there's nothing that will ever happen in your life without you giving yourself the permission to do it. You are the top peer pressure in your life. So what are those choices that you've permitted yourself to run your life on? Our minds or our brains are subdivided into two. We have the conscious mind, the now mind. We also have the subconscious mind. This is the mind that does not go to bed. It does not sleep. This is the mind that is awake 24-7. Now, the things that you process with your conscious mind are the things that are going to be digested in your subconscious mind. So when you go to sleep, when you're supposed to act in haste, when you're supposed to act subconsciously, you find the choices that you give yourself through your conscious mind. Those are the things that you're going to apply. So how do you shape your subconscious mind? You shape your subconscious mind by guiding your conscious mind into the kind of things that you want to be replicated. You find when you are in the process of eating your food. You've enjoyed the meal, you've enjoyed the meal. It was nyamachoma and there's some bit of meat <laughs> left in some part of your mouth, buco cavity, your teeth. There's that person because, I mean, you're in your own house and there's no one who is here to check on what you're doing. You find someone uh, wants to pick their tooth uh, or sometimes when they, there is some cold, they want to pick their nose, you're doing it in your conscious mind. So what happens is that when you are in your subconscious mind, when you're speaking with some friends in some forum and you feel that there's something in your nose, just because when you were in your conscious mind, you did it, you permitted yourself to do it, how you do anything is how you do everything. You'll find yourself in public still picking your nose. Why? In your closet, in your consciousness, you permitted yourself and you passed it as something that can be done. It's right. You are sitting having that lunch with the president. I remember some time back I had the lunch with the president. And uh, this time around, oh, you're even sitting at Kempinski with some international visitors who have visited you. And you find since you permitted yourself to be those people who are picking their teeth uh, when you're in private, what happens in public? You'll find yourself eating that food. And at, after some point, you really want to get your finger there and do what you Evolving, whatever you do in secrecy or in private, somehow it's going to come out in public. You can hide your reputation. You can play with the rest of the world about how good you are, about how acceptable you are, about how kind you are. But when the rubber meets the road, your character will always speak the truth about you. 
When you're talking to couples, you always tell them, if as a lady you're arrogant at the office, you're always malicious, you're always lying, then make sure that you do also do the same at home. Trigger your conscious mind to do exactly what you've been permitting yourself to do. Now, is that how you want to treat your children, to be arrogant, to be rough at them, to be screaming at them? If that's not the answer, then you trigger your mind that do unto others as you'd like them to do to you. So for that reason, you're not going to find yourself screaming to people at the office. You're going to change your choices, change your multiple choices. If you're that person who is arrogant at the office, chances of you being arrogant at your child, chances of you being arrogant at your spouse, very, very high. Chances of you being arrogant at yourself, very, very high. Ukiona vinaelea vinaundwa choices. So when you're in your consciousness, are you an effective communicator? Are you that person who is living the kind of a life that you'd like to be celebrated by the best of your friends? How about you treating your colleagues as if they were best of your friends? How about you in as much as you're stronger than that person or you're more senior than them, instead of you treating them in an unkind manner, how about you giving yourself a multiple choice that you're going to guide yourself to what is right? How about you telling yourself, this could be my child or my spouse, and you give them the best treatment possible. How you do anything guides how you're going to do everything. So we said you're the way you are because of your nature. That's how you're wired. Number two, about because, because of your choices. Now, you're also the way you are because of your nature. Nature is how you were brought up. Now, are you an effective communicator as a father? On most occasions, you find if you are nurtured by a father who is a choleric, ule baba kingia kwa nyumba watoto wana take cover. Kudish, kudish, dad has come. And everyone just wants to run away because they know he's a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, chances are very high because that's how you are nurtured. You might also replicate the same and become a father. When you get to the house, you are a terrorist. If you are that mother who grew up in a situation whereby your, your mother was the individuals who are very kind, who are very considerate. You know, the Ugandan ladies, we are told, always kneeling at the husband and telling them all the nices. You are serving them as if they are your king. Chances are very high that when it comes to your communication to your spouse, when you're serving them food or when you're addressing them, you're going to become a replication of the kind of nurturing that you got. So how good have you been at acting right? How good have you been at reshaping how you'd like things done in your house? It could be that you are nurtured by parents who are arrogant or non-present parents, lesser parents, those who just allow kids to continue growing and they, they, they don't shape their growing, they don't shape their parenting. Then it's going to be very hard for these children to pick the right example. Now, in communication, effective communication in families, we always recommend that the two leaders, uh, the president and the running mates, <laughs> uh, the husband and the spouse, uh, they come up with an agreement of how they're going to do their communication. Probably you can agree that there's no screaming in our house and you make sure that there's never going to be any kind of screaming in that house. You agree there's no shouting in our house. Let that be a rule. Let it be a place somewhere in your bedroom, yeah, or somewhere in your washroom or your bathroom or some closet somewhere where you're able to be looking at those rules that you give yourself every single day. You become each other's accountability partner. You agree that in our house, there's no screaming, there's no shouting, and you agree anyone who screams, anyone who shouts, this is the fine that is going to be subjected to that kind of an individual. And you find, because you've already agreed with your conscious mind that this is how we want our communication to be in the family, it's going to be very easy for the children to follow suit. If you do it right as parents, you know what? The children are going to emulate you. If they don't see you screaming, if they don't see you uh, banging the doors, if they don't see you doing all those negative things, chances are very high you're going to give them some good nurturing and it's going to be very easy for them to follow suit. Now, when you talk about 
positive communication or effective communication in family, then it's good for us, especially to put a lot of emphasis on the way we are wired. And you find there's no way you're going to treat all the children the same. There's a child that is very talkative. There's a child that is very proactive. They are sending themselves even before you send them. They are always vol volunteering to do these kind of things. And you find there's another one who is introverted, the, the, the phlegmatic, and this person is just reserved. They're just locking themselves in the room. They're not watching television with the others. When everyone else wants to go out, this child does not want to go out. One of the worst cases that you can do as a parent is to blame or victimize the child who is laid back and you keep shouting, screaming to them, can't you be like your brother? Can't you be like your sister? That is one of the things that has destroyed many children. No one wants to be compared with another human being. You don't tell your husband, can't you be like other men? You don't tell your wife, can't you be like other women? You don't tell that child, can't you be like the other person? On, we are told that on everyone's face are the initials make me feel important. How good have you been as a father, as a mother in helping that other party to feel that they are important? And we say that how you do anything is how you do everything and everything you do communicate something. So how do you ensure that you have effective communication? Number one, agree who is supposed to communicate that. There are those things that are supposed to be communicated by the father. There are those things that are supposed to be communicated by the mother. There are those things that are supposed to be communicated by the teacher. For example, some bad thing has happened. We've lost someone or some bad news has happened. It's good for you to agree who is supposed to communicate this. And in who is supposed to communicate this, we are looking at the way you are wired. We are looking at the choices that, that that person is most likely going to make. We are looking at the way they are nurtured, how they are brought up. And if you find that you are the choleric, who is strong-willed, who is not moved, who is not so emotional, who does not cry anyhow when things don't happen the way they are supposed to happen, probably you are the person who is supposed to do that kind of a communication. But if it's some sad news, someone can easily break and you're sending, a sanguine to go break the news, then the news is not going to get to the end recipient. Yeah. So who is going to communicate the news? Sit down, agree what is supposed to be communicated by what. Punishment is part of communication. How do you communicate? Who is supposed to do that communication? It's good for you to understand to, to agree. When it comes to this, this person shall do it. When it comes to this person, this, this person, or both of us can do, but this is how we've agreed that you're going to do it. Then the other bit is when shall we communicate? When to communicate is as important as what to communicate. So it's not just about you blabbering anything that you feel like communicating anytime, but it's about you testing the right time. You're asking yourself, when is the right time for us to do this communication? Probably someone is tired. They're just about to go for they want to have a nap or they're just late. They want to rush for work. You don't stop them and start telling them things. Yeah, You find you might not ask rights yeah, by communicating that thing when the person is on the verge of leaving. So most of us, they ask amiss. We ask, but we don't receive. Why? Because we ask amiss. So how do you guide and govern yourself to know exactly when you are supposed to communicate? There's the right time to communicate to your husband. There's the right time to communicate to that child. There's the right time to communicate that punishment to that individual. It's not a must that when they've done something wrong, that's the time you want to communicate the punishment immediately. You can probably ask yourself, when is the best time for me to do the communication? And we always advocate for couples. It's good for you to be creating time. Now we are talking about the how of communication. It's good for you to create time and go out occasionally, it can be once every two weeks or at least once a month. And you want to reflect about your parenting, about your sex life. You want to come to check about your finances, about your career. Is everything moving in the direction that it ought to? Now, some of those topics might not be discussed at your sitting room because of the interruption that might be there. Some of those topics 
uh, best discussed probably in a neutral place. You can go for a retreat somewhere. You can take a walk somewhere. You can sit in some restaurant over a cup of tea, coffee. <laughs> yes, and you're able to really check out how do I communicate this thing to that other person. And the how of communication becomes very, 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 very critical. So how do you communicate surprising news? How do you communicate bad news? How do you communicate good news? How do you communicate celebration? The how becomes very important. The where of communication, very, very critical. And the why of communication. Sometimes the communication or the communication we do is not effective because it's not relevant. So by the time you're opening your mouth, by the time you're putting that facial expression or you're doing those other kind of things, the good thing to ask yourself is, is it necessary? It's good for us to choose our battles wisely. There's some battles that we just give them time and they get solved. There are others that we just do something in order for things to happen. Now, as we near the end of this, of this conversation, it's good for us to know that 7% of our effective communication comes from the choice of words. 7% comprises of the words that you choose as a communicator. That 8% is all about how you deliver those words. So it's not about just the words, but it's about the how of delivering those words. 55% comprises of your body language. There's no, you can tell someone I love you, or I love you, or I love you, no? So your body language, constitutes 55% of the effectiveness of that communication. So how then do we make sure that this 55% and 38% and 7% is well taken care of? When it comes to verbal communication, we are looking at your tone of variation. Are you that flat person? We are talking, looking at intelligent poses. Probably you said something that people need to clap. We are looking at your pitch. We are looking at your pacing. There's no way you're going to just pull everything. Are you able to pace some words and slow down at some, at some point? We are looking at your choice of words. We are looking at your breathing. There are some people who are with a eh, or oh, how come you don't have a eh, or oh, when you're speaking to your children? Most probably because you're at ease, yeah? So you can control your breathing to ensure that that happens right. Sometimes that communication is not effective because someone is too low. You are speaking to someone when they're in the kitchen and you're in the table room and you can't hear each other. So the volume, is the volume okay? Now, when you look at the body language, you're asking about your hand's position. The moment you are like this, it means probably you want someone to reflect about it, Selah. You want someone to just mind their own business. You want just someone to reflect about it, yeah? The facial expression is very important. Your dress code, how do you go to bed? How do you go to office, yes? Standing style, your eye contact, the handshake, the gestures, the hugs, all this communicate a lot. Finally, looking at post-COVID, COVID has caused things to happen, things that are unprecedented, things that we are not used to. And it's good for us to take this time to really understand the people that we are living with. What are those kind of things that have been guiding their day-to-day -day experiences? What, what are those stresses that these people are going through? So before you open your mouth to say hi to that spouse, it's good for you to really look at their body language. Before you punish that kid, it's good for you to look at your body language. It's good for you to look at the way it's going to be decoded. The moment you beat that kid, because of breaking the glass. They were just assisting to take them in the kitchen. What are you telling them? You're telling them that it's wrong to make a mistake. You're telling them that it's wrong for them to take chances or risk, yeah? But to that kid, probably the beating might not work as, as a form of communication. The thing that was supposed to have worked there was for you to tell them, Dora, what happened? Yeah, sorry, it broke. Next time, what do you, do? What do you think you did wrong? You help them think through it. I think I carried so many of them and I didn't check there was water on the floor. I stepped on it and I slid. So what do you think should happen next time? Yeah, with that, you're telling them that they're more important than the glasses, they're more important than the plate, but the beating tells them that the plate is more important than them. So COVID-19 has set us to a place of slowing down, of us playing emotional intelligence and helping us to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. My parting shot is this, there's no way you can have effective communication without employing the law of empathy. What is empathy? Empathy <clears throat> is putting yourself in other people's shoes. 
Empathy rides on two laws. The first law is the golden rule. It dictates do unto others as you'd like them to do to you. The second law that governs empathy, putting yourself in other people's shoes, is treat me as I would like to be treated. As you deal with that individual, employ empathy. And with that, you won't have issues communicating effectively. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tijo, for that wonderful session. When I just thought it was beginning, it has come to an end. I think we will need to revisit this uh, in the coming days because it's a conversation that is huge. It's a conversation we cannot be able to exhaust in one sitting. You're but right. I think as you were talking, um, mm -hmm. I was beginning to have the feeling that most of the conflicts that people have at the family level perhaps mm -hmm. are just because we do not take time to understand how the other person operates in terms of their nature, in terms of their nurture, in terms of some of their choices. And uh, I'm, I've, I've just been laughing at myself, remembering a story that I had, uh, I think yesterday, but one, mm -hmm. of, of a situation that happened in a family. And, and since we began the family show, uh, my mind has been revolving around things that have been happening in the family uh, lately. And I met a guy who told me a story and he told me that in the recent times, I think the husband lost the job in this pandemic and, and the wife was still doing uh, her job. Mm -hmm. So table sort of turned and there is this day that they had delayed in paying rent. Apparently in, in the days before this happened, the man used to take care of rent. So then the, husband, the, the landlord walked in. And so when the landlord walked in, the landlord asks, I'm saying this riding on your point of it's important for you to define who communicates about what. So the landlord comes and finds the two of them in the living room. And the landlord asks, uh, so what, what is your plan about the payment of the rent? And then they start Upiniana Macho. The other one, is, the wife is, 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 is doing it to the husband. You say <laughs> so, so each of them is throwing the ball to the other and, and that mm. happened for a while and the guy said the awkwardness in the room was so huge so huge and, and so I, I think I want to agree with you that the point of just agreeing who communicates what kind of things to who uh, yeah. it, it's, it's very important I have two questions in my WhatsApp I think we have uh, about five minutes to go uh, so very quickly, let's just see whether you can say something about it. Okay. The first question um, says that um, I am tired with my spouse constantly reminding me of things we resolved a long time ago. Uh, we talked about it, ended it amicably and agreed that it was behind us. But every time a similar thing or not even a similar thing happens, um, my spouse keeps bringing it up and up again. So I want you to think about this. Let me just ask both of them together. The second question uh, concerns parenting, communication between parent and child. And this one is saying that um, recently, my daughter, whom we used to communicate very easily with, begins to coil away every time we try to uh, call her for a conversation. What could be the problem? What are your thoughts on these two concerns? Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful questions. Now, the one on communication, the one on communication, mother, daughter, or father, daughter, is, is, is quite critical. And we agreed that it's good for us to really understand nature, nurture, choices. So look at yourself as the parent. We always say that the person who has been accused or the person who is suffering loss is the problem. So as the parent, tell yourself that I am the problem. And you ask yourself, what if I'm the problem? What could it be that I'm not doing right? Try, try to evaluate your environment. Probably at workplace, there are some things which are happening that you're not happy about. Both Anakusukuma and your colleagues are not happy with you and you're just about to be terminated from your employment. Probably it could be your health. Things are not happening right. And you find subconsciously you're having stress. You're almost getting into depression. They tell us this 
hurting people hurt. If you're hurting in the inside, you'll always look for someone to hurt. So how about you, first of all, taking a thought, taking an internal reflection about what is happening in your world. Two, create time to sit with that individual and also understand what is happening in their world. We say that communication must not always be verbal. Yeah, so there are some few things that you can pick here and there from the way that person conducts themselves, from the way they run their life, and you're able to tell that they're having issues or stress because of A, B, C, D. They tell us this, good questions inform, but great questions transform. You can learn the art of asking the right questions. Don't ask closed-ended questions. Are you happy? They're going to tell you yes or no. Are you going to school? Yes or no. How about asking open-ended questions? Questions that are going to guide someone into giving more than just a yes or a no. It can be also investigating that person through the person who is closest to them, their best friend or their brother or their sister. And with that, you're able to really get to understand what is happening. So number one, look at yourself evaluate your life and find out what is happening. Do a lot of observing, do a lot of listening. Most of us tell ourselves that you're good listeners, but probably we are not. Cholerics suffer from listening issues, yeah? They want to say more than listening. As a parent, how good have you been as a listener? Are you that person who's able to ask a question and just pause? Are you that person who is empathetic? Do you have a positive mindset? Or you're that person who is always judging, yes? Do you have the courage of approaching this individual and asking what is supposed to be asked, yeah? So don't be judgmental, don't become a critic, uh, don't employ contempt, don't uh, have defensiveness, always uh, defending what you said yesterday, even if it's not right, put yourself in the other person's shoes and eventually it's going to be. If you feel that it's something that is prolonged and probably you need a life coach, someone to sit with your daughter, then we are available and I'm sure that can be done. Now, the other bit is about parenting. Roy, if you don't mind, you can remind me the second question. This is about communication. In marriage, remind me again, just a hint. Uh, there was the one on um, the daughter coiling, a daughter yes. who used to be active in communication. Nowadays, uh, every time they want to have a conversation with her, she uh -huh. begins to coil into her private space. Mm -hmm. So you've answered that. This, the, the first yes. one was, the other question. Yes, yes. Then there is this one that the spouse keeps reminding them of things they resolved long time ago. So they keep coming up and up, yet mm -hmm. the, the person here thinks or believes that they resolved and that was the end okay. of it. The whole okay. thing was to be planned. Wonderful. Now, we talked about nature, nurture, choices. And we agreed that in the category of introverts, we have the melancholies. And we agreed that melancholies have got very good minds, they've got very good brains. They don't forget easily. Yeah, these are the people who might forgive you, but unfortunately they might not forget. This individual will tell you that you did this to me on 15th of January, 2011. You also repeated the same on 12th of September, 2016, and now you're doing it again. It could be that they forgave you, but because their memory is very good, they're just reminding you exactly what happened. And you find for the extroverts, the sanguines, they keep forgetting easily and they don't keep a record of wrongs. Not that they don't want to keep it, but their minds cannot hold things for that long. So it's good for you to really put yourself into that other person's shoes, employ empathy, and try to really find whether this person forgave you wholeheartedly, yeah? Could it be that you did not apologize the way they expected you to apologize? Remember, we talked about empathy, the golden rule and the platinum rule. Now, platinum rule dictates, treat me as I would like to be treated. Probably the way they expected you to apologize is not the way you apologize. And for that reason, this thing was not trapped off. It, they are always, they're always reminding you about it. But it, uh, you cannot change anyone. The only person that you can change is yourself. You can convert those constant reminders into a lesson, into a learning point. And you tell yourself that, the next time I'm reminded, it's just a trigger that I should not do anything negative to this individual or to that other individual. Or I should be very cautious. The words that I use, 
because the moment I use those words on that child or on that spouse, I'm never going to forget it. So it can act as a trigger. It can work for your good. Romans 8, 28, in all things, God works together for the good. So that which seems to be triggering you into anger and anxiety can be converted to work into your good. It all depends on your perception. Perception is everything. Again, we can still continue with this conversation in case we didn't answer it to your satisfaction. Thank you. Thank you so much, DJ. Thank you so much. Uh, it's unfortunate that our time is far much gone. How we would love to have this again and again and again. Most certainly we will have you back one of these Mondays because the family show just began. Very many other shows coming and this show is here to stay. Just before we finish, if you are new on this channel, please take a second to subscribe so that you do not miss out. Every time we are broadcasting something, you get to be notified. Make sure you also hit the notification bell so that you are not left behind. Uh, Tijo is a published author of uh, two titles now. The first title that Tijo did is a very interesting book that um, sheds light on uh, some of the things that he has been talking about and that book is called Between Me and My Exploits. So you've been an are they called exploiters or explorers or someone who wants to exploit something, but there is something that's standing between you and those exploits, right? And, and that book is called Overcoming Self-Imposed Limitation. That's the writer of the book. The second title that Tijo just released, um, it, it's still smelling of uh, the, 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 the oven heat. It's called Go for Gold, The Art of Asking Right. Right. Uh, Tijo, maybe before you sign off, please tell us where we can find you, those that may want to connect with you kindly. Okay, those, thank you so much, Coach Roy, for the opportunity. Those who'd like to connect with me, you can look for me on my social media platforms. The first one is the Facebook. You can look for Joel Cobia, Tijo. Uh, you can also check my uh, my Twitter handle, Joel Cobia Tijo. You can also check out my channel, YouTube channel, Joel Cobia Tijo TV. And for the books, you can find them through the link mzizi.com. Is it mzizi, Coach Roy, or mzizi? Mzizi, with a double, with a double. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's M Z I double Z I dot com stroke royal lead books yes m z i double z i stroke royal lead books and you'll find all my books there you can also do the same zizi.com m z i double z i and you'll find all the titles done by coach roy okonji wow Thank you so much, good people. Uh, that is how we get to get hold of Tijo. If you want to ask him some personalized questions, if you want to in interact with him or get in touch with his books, uh, thank you so much for having been with us since the beginning of this show. Permit me then to say a word of prayer before we end the show officially. Shall we pray? Almighty and everlasting Father, we come before you once again to thank you, to glorify your name because you've been faithful, Father. We committed this meeting in your hand, Father, and we prayed for success, and indeed you have granted us success. How we pray for every family that has been represented here, and we pray, God Almighty, that you may meet them at their points of need, because only you understand the innermost needs that they have. We continue to pray for God for the family show that God Almighty will continue using it to inspire, to equip, and to transform families. We thank you even for the opportunity for using us to be vessels of that transformation. Until we meet again, we pray, God, that you may keep us safe. And it is in Jesus' name we believe and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep safe. Until we meet again, it is goodbye and good night. All right, good night.